Good morning, church. Please open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. This morning, I want to welcome you to a family. A family that gets bigger, better, and closer, no matter how quarantined you are. You know, this, kind of, this time of day reminds me of a, of a movie, Lilo and Stitch. And they have this saying in the movie. It's a bit of a Hawaiian saying. And it goes, Ohana. Ohana means family. Family means no one gets left behind. Please, uh, please read with me in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing. But encourage each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. This right here is an incredible scripture. And I believe this scripture describes our family. This scripture des describes our church. You know, right now is a time where everyone is to be at home and to not go outside. To not go and meet other people or meet up as we usually do. But this has not stopped us. Now I'm not saying we're breaking the law. In fact, we're going viral. We're going on webcam. Uh, it wasn't just a couple of days ago when we had our midweek service and still everyone in the church was there encouraging one another and motivating each other. But more than that, we had eight visitors come to our online service. That is incredible. And that is definitely an encouraging and growing family. So this morning, I want to welcome you to a family that continues to grow no matter how quarantined they are. I want to welcome you to a family that continues to get closer no matter how far away we live from each other. I want to welcome you to a family in a day and age where God has made everything possible for us to still be connected and encourage each other daily. With that, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for the service that we get to have with you. Thank you so much for the hearts you get to move. But above all, thank you so much, Lord, for how, you get to, for how we get to be encouraged by one another, no matter how far we are, no matter how close we are, it doesn't matter the distance, the time, whatever it is, Father, we get to be closer and stronger together as a family because of what you have set up for us. Thank you so much for how we still get to see one another today, Father. And I do pray for all those who are in need. I pray you be with them, Lord. I pray you give them strength. And I pray, uh, Father, for a good service today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. On the note of encouragement, church, I want to give you a daily dose of encouragement. Recently, we've been uh, locked into our houses and unable to go outside. But that has not stopped the movement. If you go on Facebook, if you go on Instagram, you are sure to find disciples studying the Bible with someone, no matter how far they are or how far away they may be. In fact, there have been Bible studies uh, all over the world, in America and many other churches, online. And there have also been great fruit produced from this. In Samoa, our, our dear sister Beric was able to baptize her cousin, Linda. And then when we go to Hong Kong, our sister church in Hong Kong, where the virus has had the longest impact, we have seen that they have been able to baptize an incredible young woman called Melissa. Melissa is Indonesian Chinese and speaks four languages. Indonesian, Mandarin, Cantonese, and English. She speaks them fluently. If we need to go beyond that, we've also had our sister church in Australia still baptized, no matter how much the, the measurements of lockdown have been increased. We have had our dear brother, Sibyl and Chris added to the kingdom of God. Good morning, thank you for joining us again. This is a part of our service where we take up communion. And if you would like, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and we're gonna be reading verse two. Communion is just a time where we take up the juice that represents Jesus' blood, and the bread which represents Jesus' body, and reflect over what the cross means to us. Now, over video, I'm going to be introducing to you uh, Jessica Salvador, who's gonna be talking about what communion means to her. But before she does, 
I'm just going to read this scripture for her that she would like for us to read. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It reads here, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And with that, we'll transfer it over to Jessica Salvo. Thank you, Sean, for sharing the scripture. I love the scripture because it describes whom I should focus on throughout my day. This includes my thoughts, my speech, and how I live. By fixing my eyes on Jesus, and not just when I take communion, I can be continuously transformed to be more and more like him and less like myself. And this is what the cross means to me. It is a constant reminder that his blood is a continual purification and transformation to not to be who I used to be, but to be more like Jesus. Throughout the five years of being a disciple, I see my sin more and more. Since being in Auckland, God has helped me to realize that not only am I weak, but I'm very selfish. My thoughts are reflected on myself, whether it's my job, my coworkers, my sin, my worries. And I prioritize these things and put these things as my number one. Through my speech, my prayers are not guided to God, but have become very repetitive. And they are only about myself and my struggles. Quiet times with God have not been in depth because I want to fight the battle on my own and deal with my sin on my own rather than taking instructions from God. This scripture pierced my heart very deeply because on the cross, Jesus didn't fix his eyes on himself, but on God. If Jesus could summarize his life with one sentence, it will look like Luke 19, 10. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. God helped me to realize that I have been guided by everything except for his high calling. The beautiful thing about the cross is that it's not only very sobering, but it's a motivator to not to use this excuse of, this is who I am, but to use Jesus as the example of whom I can be. The heart of Jesus was pure. The Savior was adored by thousands, yet he was happy to live a very simple life. Jesus' heart was peaceful. His disciples were worried about feeding the 5,000, but Jesus thanked God for the problem. His thoughts were so pleasant. He could find beauty in lilies and joy in worship. His thoughts reflected an intimate relationship between himself and his spiritual father. His first sermon, his first recorded sermon begins, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he allowed himself, to, he also allowed himself to be humble and take direction by God before selecting his first disciples. My heart is so far from this. The distance between my heart and his and his seems so immense. But with the cross, with his sacrifice, Jesus has given me the opportunity to imitate his heart. On the cross, not only did Jesus give his spirit to God, but he surrendered his spirit in order to give it to me to baptism so that I can be continuously transformed and continuously changed. With the cross, we didn't have to be present when it happened because now we have it written in the Bible so that we can use it as an example of love to be transformed. Even in this time of this pandemic, God wants us, wants us to change, to be in the likeness of his savior, that, and that is through the cross. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. With that, if I can ask everyone please now to bow your heads in a word of prayer. We're going to pray over the communion, and then the next little moment we'll give you time to reflect over it. Please bow your heads. Father God, thank you so much for this time, Father, that we get to just reflect again what the cross means to us. That your sacrifice, Father, gives us strength, and that we can see this is not just an example, but something that we can never do ourselves, Father. That you had to face the shame that we should have faced. You had to face all, uh, face all these things that we should have faced, Father. God, thank you so much for your sacrifice. I pray that each and every single one of us can get deeper, uh, get deeper in feeling with the cross, and we love you very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And here is my soul, and let us journey on, for the night is dark, and I am far from home, thanks be to God.
Thanks be to God, the morning light appears. The storm is passing over. Don't you know the storm is passing over? The storm. Well, good morning, church. Uh, this is the time of the service where we take up our weekly giving. Uh, for those of you who are visiting uh, with us, uh, this is the time where we, um, we as a church have uh, made a pledge to the amount that we usually give on a weekly basis. Um, you're more than welcome to join in with us um, if you are happy to. Um, and scripture that I want to share with you all this morning comes from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, uh, where it says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. Now in this scripture right here, uh, this is Paul writing to the church uh, in Corinth, and he's sharing the example of the, uh, the disciples from the different churches within Macedonia. So that would be the churches in Thessalonica and Philippi, um, uh, just as an example. That's where you get um, the letters from uh, 1st and 2nd uh, Thessalonians and the book of Philippians from. And he shares that the example that these guys showed was amazing um, in their generosity. Uh, because at this time, uh, the church in Jerusalem, or rather the whole city of Jerusalem, was going through a famine, and these guys were in much need. Um, and so what happened was Paul, he goes back to uh, the churches in Macedonia, who themselves were also going through poverty, and he, um, he asked them to, to give generously as well. And what's interesting to see here is just the attitude that they had. Um, the attitude that they, that they had, they, they, they had every reason to just go, wait, well, what about us? We're the ones who are in need. We're the ones who are in, in poverty right now. But instead, their, their attitude, it says it right here in the scripture, uh, it says that they had overflowing joy. Now, the question is, why? Why do they have overflowing joy? Well, in verse 5, uh, it says that they gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So it's, uh, it shows that right here, they had to go to God first to get their hearts right about giving. Um, and so because of their overflowing joy and their willingness to give, they were able to give more than what was expected. And so it makes me think about right now the, um, the uh, situation that we're all currently in. Um, you know, it's the reason why I'm actually recording from my bedroom, <laughs> um, which is uh, the coronavirus. Um, at this time, we are just kind of hunkered down and we're, you know, we're going to be stuck in our homes for the, the next four weeks minimum. Uh, but prayerfully, you know, we'll be out of this pretty soon. Um, but people see this as a time to really hold on to their money um, as tightly as they can. And so in, in a way, 
you know, we, we do have every reason to hold on to our money. Um, and we also do have every reason to believe that we are the ones who are in need. We're not in a place where, where I can give. Or if I am in a place to give, then I'll just, you know, this seems like a reasonable amount to give. Um, but interestingly, though, uh, when you actually take a, a moment to, to think about it, you know, God has put in place the government that we have um, to support us during these tough times. Uh, for example, you know, the government has put a, a freeze on rent increase. Um, also, uh, we still have essential workers who are still going out there uh, in supermarkets who are still willing to, to work and get all the food on the shelves and everything. Um, and then also, lastly, we have all the healthcare workers who are still working tirelessly at the hospital who don't really have much time to go home and, um, and to spend time with their, uh, with their family. Uh, these people are still at work. And so the government has given us uh, these people, uh, these situations to, to help support us during these times. So we're not exactly in a point where, uh, where we're in famine or we're in poverty or, or anything like that. We're just simply locked in. And if anything, uh, this situation actually allows us to not spend as much money. Um, so in a way, God has given us the opportunity to be able to give even more than what is expected. So even when we think we need our, our money, again, being at home actually helps prevent us from spending way too much. Um, so my challenge to you uh, this morning, church, is uh, to don't let the, uh, the coronavirus be the reason that you don't give or hold back from giving, but rather my challenge is to focus on God and uh, let it be the reason that you give more. And that is my, my contribution. Let us bow our heads in a quick word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to give to you, uh, to, and that you're always providing us uh, with our needs, and you're always uh, providing us everything uh, that, again, <laughs> that we need in life, Father. And I just pray that as we give uh, this morning, I pray that we, we do it generously, and I pray that we can also do it joyfully, Father. I pray that we can, uh, we can always go to you first, um, you know, when we have, you know, different feelings, and especially now with the, the coronavirus, you know, causing us to uh, hunker down and stay indoors, Father. I pray that it doesn't discourage us at all. But God, we love you so much. Thank you again for this time. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And I also want to say thank you for those who give online. The blind man sat by the road and he cried. The blind man sat by the road and he cried. The blind man sat by the road and he cried. He cried, oh, show me the way. Woman sat by the well and she cried. The woman sat by the well and she cried. The woman sat by the well and she cried. She cried, oh, she said, show me the way. Show me the way. She said, show me the way. Show me the way. She said, show me the way. Show me the way. The way to go home. Jesus hung on the cross and he died. Jesus hung on the cross and he died. I said, Jesus hung on the cross and he died. He died. Oh, he said, I am the way. I am the way. Jesus said, I'm the way.
take your name, take your name. Show me the way. Talk to your name. Come on. Oh, yes, he is. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for tuning in to our very first virtual Sunday church service. It was actually super encouraging and great just to join the fellowship earlier this morning. Uh, actually, as the Auckland International Christian Church, we all just kind of video chat in over the app Zoom that everyone's kind of rediscovering right now. And it was great to see everyone dressed in their church best, that we don't just get dressed up just to impress that one brother or that one sister, amen. I guess I'm going to have to get used to you guys not saying amen back. But it, it was awesome that we got dressed up just because we knew that we were still here to worship God. Before I actually start this, this lesson this morning, uh, I want to ask for any of those that are tuning in or listening in just via YouTube, if you would like to receive the upcoming messages or sermons that we do every single week, all you have to do is message me on sean.valenzuela at usd21.org, and the email will be there at the bottom of the screen. And if you message me personally, I will send that out to you every week as we continue to do these lessons over YouTube. But as we jump in, if you want to turn in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Daniel chapter 3. You know, I believe most of us, if not all, We'll face a time where we have to make a decision between one of two things in our lives. This dilemma may be placed in front of us, or we may just come across it throughout our time. We wish at these moments that there is a third option that we can kind of manufacture. And we waste a lot of time pondering and theorizing how we can just get the best of both worlds. We would actually pay for an option that we can have this this, this choice, but it never comes. Why? Mainly because it doesn't exist in these type of situations. These are the situations where you have to choose either going right or left. Either you're going to choose to quit or to continue, to speak up or stay silent. These are those black and white situations I'm talking about. And the choice to have faith or faith to have fear is becoming a choice that a lot of people are facing today. That's why today I believe God has put on my heart to start a series called Fearless. As a lot of people are turning to fear in isolation, in the church we're going to preach God's word where we're going to turn to faith and unity. My title of the first part of this series is called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego versus the Burning Furnace. Point number one is going to be decide your destiny. Before we turn and, and jump into the text in Daniel chapter 3, there's, there's a brief history I want us to all at least understand coming up to this scripture. In about 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, went and attacked and conquered Judah. And you can read that in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. Following his victory, Nebuchadnezzar ordered that the best and brightest young men of Judah be brought back to Babylon. And his plan was mainly to train these young men for three years and then give them some position in the royal court. So when we come up and, and introduce to these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they were part of this group, these young, influential men. And the three years of training in Babylon was attempt kind of to brainwash these guys. That Nebuchadnezzar wanted these young men, and the others as well, to get indoctrinated into the Babylonian culture so that they walk around and start thinking and acting like Babylonians. And they can kind of in turn be kind of like their administrators or their ambassadors to those four nations that they were taking away from. It's actually quite funny. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those aren't actually their real names. Those are the new names the Babylonians had given them. Their real names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Their first names were Jewish names. 
that actually were to honor the Lord. The names that they were later given were to honor the gods of Babylon. And maybe they didn't have that much of a fight against it just because their previous name sounded a little bit feminine to me. But maybe they're like, okay with it, who knows? But what's happening at this time? So that's kind of the brief history. What happened in Daniel chapter 2 is it was Daniel's moment. Daniel, he reveals to the king the meaning of this disturbing dream that reoccurred every night to him. He perfectly described the statue that the king saw and the different sections that represented different empires or different nations that were to come. There was the, the, the head of gold, then there was the silver, there was a the bronze, and lastly the feet and thighs were of iron and iron mixed with clay. And he was talking about each one of these sections represented a different empire, a different nation that was going to be established in the world there. Now, in the beginning when you read that, especially since Daniel is talking to Nebuchadnezzar, he's saying, man, you are the head of gold. Gold, in at least our sense, being the most valuable source uh, uh, compared to the, the silver and the bronze and the iron. Gold. And he's the head. At though, in the beginning, that might have sounded like a compliment. The king understood what it meant for the different sections to come. It would mean that his empire was about to end or one day was going to come to an end. And that it, all these nations, his included, were going to be like dust in the wind when God decided to build his own kingdom. And see, it's, it's crazy that even during that time he was telling them about this statue, Daniel actually never said when the next kingdom was going to come. It could, it could have came the next day. It could have came years from, from that time. But Daniel never told him. And so we're going to read, actually, in Daniel chapter 3, 1 through 2, how King Nebuchadnezzar responds to this dream. In verse 1 through 2, it reads, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up in the plains of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, administrators, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provisional officers to come up to the dedication of the image that he had set up. We'll pause there for a moment. What, 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 is, what does the king actually do? Once he hears this dream, he ends up making a statue of pure gold, symbolizing in his heart to show to everyone, especially the God of Judah, the God of Israel, Hey, my kingdom is never going to be destroyed. You want this other statue, the different statue? No, it's going to be pure gold. And again, this was in direct opposition to God. Because God had shown him in a dream time and time again that it was going to be destroyed. And you look at this, and you might read this and be like, wow. King Nebuchadnezzar, he is so proud. He's so arrogant to do that. But I think of him a little bit differently. I think maybe he wasn't just proud or arrogance. I think he did this maybe out of fear. Maybe he was scared that he was about to lose everything that he's ever known. I don't think he was just mean and proud. I think, I think that he was fearful what was about to be taken away from him. And I think, to be honest, a lot of us can face that type of fear as well and try to put a stance in front of God. We can fear that all those things that we attach to our purpose now are at risk and feels like they're blowing away in the wind and we cannot chase it. I think about those who have their hopes on university and that being shut down at the moment, them not knowing what they're supposed to be doing. Those whose careers are being lost in this pandemic. Those whose businesses are shutting down. And the list goes on and on about these things that, that we attach to our purpose attached to our identity are now being lost. And we're not just proud or arrogant. We're, we're a little bit scared. If I lose these things, what am I doing? So in his fear and arrogance, he does something drastic here. Continue reading 4 through 6. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, the nations and the peoples of every uh, language, this will be what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship 
will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. So in his fear, he calls everyone to worship the image. And I think maybe what's going on in his heart is that he's hoping that if he can get enough people, enough people to worship this statue, maybe it would change the future. Maybe if, if enough people agreed, it would make it true. And how, how common is that in today's society? That people base the truth off of the majority rule. And we understand that truth is not based off of just uh, opinions or based off of the majority, but it's based off of God's word. And we're going to see these men having to face this choice. Are they going to bow down to a lie? Or are they going to stand for the truth and face the consequences? Drop down to verse 8 through 15. It says, At this time, some astro astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all other, all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews who have set over the affairs, the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay a no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. That what God, then what God, will be able to rescue you from my hand. Wow. We read here that these young man, men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they had to face one of the most difficult decisions you can ever imagine. Disobey God and live, or obey God and die. And what the Babylonians soon found out is that they can change their name, but they could not change their heart. That they were going to remain loyal to God of Israel no matter what. It's funny that they keep announcing all the different kinds of music. Hey, if you don't bow down to the flute, you better bow down to the zither, all these different things. But when the music sounded, these guys still remained standing. And the king, he was furious. Not only did Daniel reveal his dream to actually be his real nightmare that he's been having every single day, now these other men of Israel, some more troublemakers of Israel, were standing up to him. I believe for him, this now became personal. I don't think it really mattered who these men were. It was who they were standing up for. That they were standing up for this God that was going to destroy his nation. And he was taking it personal, and he was mad about it. But God already, already knew what the king was doing. God saw what was in his heart of him setting up this statue, of his making people bow down to it. He's like, it's not going to change anything. I'm still going to do what I have set in place. And guess what, King? I'm going to have slaves stand up to you. And that's how your nation is going to be brought down. And we read all this. And we see what a dire situation this is and a difficult decision. And most people can ask, hey, Daniel, where are you at, man? Where, where's Daniel in these scriptures? Like, Daniel, homie, th this is like the time where we need you, bro. But he, he's nowhere to be found. Well, most people might think or might, um, you know, jump to conclusion and think, well, maybe Daniel, he started bowing down to the statue and therefore he, he, he doesn't, his life is not at risk. Well, that's something that you can kind of just denounce because actually later on in Daniel chapter 6, 
He was willing to die for him just praying to God. So I'm assuming it wasn't he was scared of death here. Actually, in the end of Daniel chapter 2, he gets promoted. And most people theorize and believe that he was probably out um, in some other foreign nations kind of doing his new responsibilities. But it's pretty crazy that regardless of what Daniel was, it didn't really matter. Even though the leader was gone, they were still going to make a stand for God. Most religious people actually only make a stand for God when the pastor's in town, when they're talking and around other religious people. That's the only time where they have enough confidence to make these types of decisions. It's even funny how watered down the standard in, in the religious world today is about even sharing your faith in the world. They will say, hey, I share my faith with other, my other religious friends. That, that, that's not evangelism. That's fellowship. That's not the same thing. You got to understand the standards that we have to stand up for God no matter what. See, even though Daniel was nowhere in sight in these scriptures, I love how the Bible didn't think it was important or God didn't think it was important to mention what he was doing. I love that it, it, it makes that vague. And where we have to think about it. Because what it's putting, at least on my heart, is that it wasn't Daniel's moment. He did not need to be mentioned in these scriptures. Because Daniel already had his moment. He already talked to the king. He already faced him. It was these guys' moment now. And I believe that's with all of us. That we're all in a moment in our life. We are going to have to, we're going we're to be called to make a stand. And it won't matter where he is or what she's doing. You will have to make that choice. And there's not going to be another option. You're not going to have a third, third option. Either you're going to stand for God or you're going to bend the knee. Now think about it, putting myself in their situation right now. We can ask the question, what would you do? I know if I was in their place, I might rationalize a different couple of reasons why it might not be so bad to bow down to that idol. Well, many people will say, hey, I'll bow now. I'll bow down, but I won't worship it. I'll, my knees will bow. Physically, I'll be bowing, but in my heart, ugh, total rebellion. Totally not going for it. And people rationalize that. People will say sometimes maybe, hey, I, I, I'll bow down this time, just one time, and then I'll ask God for forgiveness. Oh, but God, hey, I'm in a foreign land. I have to obey their customs. That's why you brought me here, right? I have to be respectful. I'll do that now, but in my heart, again, I'm not worshiping it. Or you might even rationalize, hey, well, everyone else is doing it. And the thing is, it's scary, is that you have to catch yourself on this. If you start thinking that sinning for God is going to make you more effective, you better think again. Nowhere in the Bible does it say sinning is a good thing for God. God doesn't care about it. And see, I believe that most of us, we're going to have to face one of these moments in our life. I believe the most life-changing moments that you will face in your life are the ones that you do not get a redo. That is not good enough to say, hey, I'll do better next time. You only get one chance. One opportunity. One real shot at it. And that's it. And we don't always have the privilege to choose what fires we are going to face and when we're going to face them in our lives. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were people just like you and me. Just like us. They were young men who were full of hopes and dreams to do something for God. They wanted to live. They wanted to have fulfill their dreams for God and their purpose. They didn't want to die, but they were faced with a difficult choice. Bow down to the image or be burned alive. And they decided to stand for God. My first challenge is that we have a choice or a choice is going to come to us where we're going to have, where we're going to draw back from the fire. Oh, excuse me. Oh, we're going to have a choice. Either we're going to draw back from the fire of facing, that we're facing in the world, or we're going to stand up. And I want to encourage everyone, stand up in this time of fear. Have faith. Stand up. 
in your sharing in sharing your faith. That is not a time to draw back, but it's a time to call and reach out to everyone in this crisis. Stand up and continue giving generously. That yes, some of us may have lost our jobs. Some of us may have, have constricted our financial situation, but continue to stand up for God. Stand up in your conviction to put God first every single day. Because where we descend, decide to kneel will determine where we stand when we are judged. If you kneel to the world, you're going to be standing under. If you kneel to God, that's when you're standing before him. Let's decide to make that stand in our lives. Point number two, faith your fear. We all know this, but decisions don't always come cheap. That once we make this choice and we muster up the courage and actually do it, we're still going to have to face some consequences. I believe as well in the scriptures is going to show us this, that they're going to have to face their fire. But let's continue reading on how exactly they are facing it. Daniel chapter 3, we're going to drop down to verse 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We, we, don't, we don't need to answer kindly to you, that's what they're saying. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods, or worship the image of gold you have set up. You know, when I read this, you, you couldn't imagine or, or think about or written a more glorious response. This was a complete mic drop, horn drop, whatever they do to make their voices louder back then. You know, that, that hey, the God we serve, whether or not he delivers us, we ain't serving you. We ain't a slave to you. We only serve one person, and that's our God in heaven. That no matter what, they were going to serve God. Their faith was not just like a faith of words or a faith of thoughts or feelings. It was a faith that determined and brought action in their life. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't just believe in God. They believed him. They just believed in him. They believed him enough to put their life on the line and say, no matter what happens, God, we know that we are still loved. See, they made up their mind. It didn't matter about the consequences. It didn't matter about any of those things, the repercussions. They were going to serve God no matter what. That God was enough for them. Salvation was extra. How crazy is that? That God was enough and their salvation on earth was extra. I love this. When they say, but even if he does not. What an amazing standard of faith. That we must have faith in God during troubles. But that doesn't always mean that we're going to be delivered. That I believe actually, now I haven't checked it out. I tried searching it up and I couldn't find anything. But there is no statistics out there showing that Christians face sickness less than the faithless. No proof, no chart that shows that we are protected from financial ruin more than others. That we face less debt. On the contrary, even when you look in the Bible, it actually talks about how we're going to face more opposition. Because the world hated Jesus, our Savior, and is going to hate us as well. It doesn't say we just have faith so that good things can happen. We have faith because we know God's character and we rely on that. See, in the Bible, it doesn't tell you all things are going to be perfect or everything's going to work out how you plan it. But it does tell you one thing. It tells you that you're loved. It promises you grace and a happy, happy living. That's what it promises, not just a happy ending. See, our faith and your faith is not based on the outcome, but it needs to be simply based off of the omega. There is no pros and cons list before you make a decision for God. 
You don't decide to be a servant of the Lord because it's better living. You do it no matter what because it's the truth and that's what you stand for. You do it because you know the truth. That the idols of this world, they're fruitless in vain. That they have nothing for you only other than temporary pleasure. That yes, if they bow down, they would have saved their lives, but that would have lost them their purpose. And they were more interested in building who they were rather than just building their life. See, you know the truth as well. That there is only one God. See, they didn't just faith, uh, face their fears. They faced their fears. It wasn't about just being brave. It was all about God. This was, this was all a faith action. It wasn't just mustering up, I'm going to face it. No, they had faith in it. And that's why they're able to face it. Deliverance or be devoured from the fire. They were going in the fire with faith. So what do we do when our faith is tested by fire? You know, well, what did they do? They believed in the truth rather than the facts. So what were the facts? The facts were the king was angry. The fire was hot. Anyone who is thrown into the fire is going to die, and they didn't want to die. Those were the facts laid before them. King angry, fire hot, don't want to die, fire kill. That, that's all they knew. But they also knew the truth, and truth over facts. That God, he was always going to do what's best for them. That either God was going to deliver them, or God was not, and they were going to meet God in heaven. Either way, it's always better obeying the Lord. See, that's how we have to face and faith each one of these. Is that we have to see the facts, but also see the truth about our Lord. And continue to go in faith and face those fires. Let's see how the story ends. Verse 19 to 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious, just like always, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the burning, burning, uh, blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their ropes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The, commands, the king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, a firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped up to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't, weren't there three that we tied and threw into the fire? And he said, look, uh, excuse me, they replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servant of the God of the Most High God, come out, come out. Yeah, I think right before they're facing this, what an amazing end to the story, but right before they're going into the fire, I would think that these three men would be facing so many different feelings. You know, that they might be looking at each other all bound up. It's like, hey man, are we really gonna do this? I wonder if did, did they say their last goodbyes? And say, hey, either I'm gonna see you in the flames or I'm gonna see you in heaven. And then and then came the moment that they're actually thrown into the fire. And they hit the floor. Maybe that still hurt. I don't know if God delivered them from the impact of the, I don't know how big the furnace was. But instead of feeling this heat around them, they feel peace. And then the next moment is like, they start talking to each other, right? Their eyes are closed and all tensed up. And they start, guys, I'm, I'm actually not feeling hot. They start opening their eyes. Maybe they blink like once or twice. They don't want to get fire in the eyes. You know, they're, they're scared still. Then came the moment that they see, they get up and they see the, 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 the ropes are burnt away. Then they see their, their now fourth friend walking around in the fire. Yeah, I don't know if this was God or whatever. That person might have felt like air conditioning seeing them, you know what I mean? But th th there would have just been a moment right there. 
And God just looking down at them and saying to himself, like, wow, these men, they're going to be an example for eternity of what it's like when you really face fires with faith. And the funny thing is, is that they were bound when they were out of the fire. Yet they were freed once they were thrown into the fire. And it teaches us a lot of things about the fires that we face. We're so scared of them. But going through those fires are the things that burn up the, the, the chains on us, that burn away the, the sin that we're entangled with, that burn away the character we can't uh, release ourselves from. Those fires is the things that bring freedom in our life. In 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, it says an awesome scripture about this. It reads here, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had some suffering, uh, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the, the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even through refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ Jesus is revealed. That that fire is something that's good in our life. That it's going to result in praise and honor towards our God. There are some things in our lives that we want to be freed from, but at the same time, we don't want to face the fire. The fire you are put through is not just your discipline. It is actually your deliverance. My second challenge for everyone is we need to faith our fires. We need to faith our fears. That we need to have an element of faith that chokes out the fear and doubt that tries to entangle our hearts. That whatever it may be during this time, that we don't give in to the propaganda around the world. We don't give in to their, their sermons about fear and hiding. But instead, we have faith in God in every single situation. In conclusion, these things may not happen every single day of our lives. These decisions that we have to make. And they're not always going to be about making a left or a right decision. But it's going to be one of those decisions that we're really scared to face. I want to encourage you today to have that faith in God. Not faith just in yourself. Whether it may be at the end of this lesson that you need to become a disciple. You need to get baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Whether that is that you need to stand up and join the new movement of God. Whether that is even something simple, you need to start studying the Bible again and giving your heart to God. Whether that is that you stand up to your family, that you get gut level open about your hidden sin in your life. Go out and face it with faith. And again, it's not for you, but for God. And with all of us. We can go out and face our fears. Thank you very much and God bless. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. 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 You gotta preach, preach. Preach the word, you gotta preach, preach, preach the word, ah, You see, I was lost before I was found, and my pride had me so far off the ground. I heard the word preacher somehow brought me down, ah, I came up the darkness from a life that was wicked And a whole bunch of mess that I wouldn't like to mention I got down on my knees and I begged the Lord, please What shall I do? Preach, preach the word, you gotta preach, preach Preach the word ah, ooh. You gotta preach Preach the word, you gotta preach the word. Word, ah, ooh. When you get low 
and your conviction You know that it's time for an intervention Reach out to your brother to help one another Ooh. Like Timothy, you don't want to become timid You want to do what Paul did when he became a Christian because he grew strong and they helped him hold on. What did he do? Preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. Ah, ooh. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach. Preach the word, ah, ooh, listen to me. Now tell everybody you know to study the Bible, to find it if your life and doctrine has been denied. Because Jesus came to seek and save and make disciples, ah, ooh, ooh. I did the same thing and now I know the truth. So I'm going to tell you when you see you know too. So you can all start living the life that's brand new. I know what to do. Preach the word. You got to preach. Preach. He told me to preach. Ah, ooh. You got to preach. Preach. Paul had to preach. He had to preach the word. Ah, ooh. You gotta preach, preach. We gotta preach. We gotta preach the word. Ah, ooh. You gotta preach, preach. Teach them to preach. Teach them to preach the word. Preach the word, ah, 